This is the Six Figure Home Studio Podcast, episode 46. You're listening to the Six Figure Home Studio Podcast, the number one resource for running a profitable home recording studio. Now your hosts, Brian Hood and Chris Graham. Welcome back to another episode of the Six Figure Home Studio Podcast. I am your host, Brian Hood. I'm here with my bald and beautiful co-host, Chris Graham, and I'm also here with my just plain beautiful guest, <laughs> Graham Cochran. How are you guys doing today? Let's start with you, Graham. The real Graham? The real yeah. Graham, the only Graham, yeah. <laughs> I'm doing great. I'm blushing over here. Oh, I'm also great. I'm pumped to be interviewing the actual most famous person with the name Graham in audio. And I'm probably top five though, so. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I would be hard pressed to believe that any of our listeners have never heard of Graham Cochran before, but if you have not heard of him before, he is the mastermind behind the recording revolution. He is one of the two guys in dueling mixes, who's also in it with one of our good friends, Joe Gilder. And he also has a new business platform that he launched somewhat recently in the last several months now, as far as I remember. It's just Graham Cochran. You just go by your name with that. So you're in a lot of different places. You're doing a lot of different things. And I can't think of a better entrepreneur to bring on this show. So we are excited to interview you today. I'm excited to be here. I appreciate both of you bringing me on. Kind of on a personal note, I'm super pumped to have you on. Uh, When I first started really getting heavy into paid advertising, and we've emailed about this before, one of the channels that I ran ads for Chris Graham Mastering on was Recording Revolution. And uh, it was great. So much appreciated, man. And you're welcome. (laughs) You're welcome. (laughs) Yes, you're welcome. I'm welcome. I remember looking at my videos and seeing some of the ads and usually there's a lot of generic ones. And then for whatever reason, I would see a lot of Ty Lopez ads. Maybe it's because I'm into passive income and stuff. But then I would see this guy named Chris Graham. I was like, that's strange. A master engineer with my name, but in the wrong place. But I thought it was really well executed and I hope it was successful for you. Well, thanks, man. I definitely at least once a month get an email from someone that says, man, I just love your tutorial videos on YouTube. (laughs) And I'm always like, oh, thank you so much. Let me show you who that actually is. I could see the confusion there. (laughs) Just smile and say thank you. Yeah. So Graham Cochran is by far above and beyond anyone else that I know, the master of content marketing. And this is something that we've brought up on the show before. We actually talked about it on episode 42 which is part one on how to find more clients for your studio. We talked briefly about content marketing as being a viable path for a lot of studios. I've seen studios successfully implement this content marketing strategy in their businesses and get clients that way. One of my friends, Mark Eckert, does this with his ebook, The Indie Pop Cookbook. And Graham has a very successful business related to content marketing. And I think he could definitely shed some light on the pros and cons of content marketing, the struggles of it, and really the key to making it work. Because I think anyone that's ever tried to do content marketing on a high level, they know it's not easy. It is very difficult to both maintain and gain any traction in. So I think a good place to start would be giving us a look into how you first found that content marketing was the key to making it work for you, how you first stumbled into that and kind of just go from there. Yeah, I didn't know it was called content marketing when I started. I didn't really know anything about business when I started. I'd been freelancing for a long time, so I understood that. I've been doing that since I was in my freshman dorm room in college. The content started out of a need for more clients. So it makes perfect sense when you brought it up. I had always been freelancing as like my side gig. It was nights, weekends, extra money, and then I had a day job. And then it was during the recession in 09 when we moved from Virginia to Florida and we bought our first house, had our first baby, and then I lost my new job. And it was hard to get jobs. I was either overqualified for just basic jobs or there were no jobs. It was just a really rough time. And so in the meantime, I was just doing freelance work and it wasn't enough to pay all the bills. You know, my wife's a photographer, so she was trying to get some gigs and I was trying to get some gigs. And I was like, I need to get more gigs. And so it came out of like, how do I get more gigs faster? And I thought, well, Nobody knows me in Florida. I just moved here. My whole network is up in Virginia. So I'm doing still remote work for them. And I hit up a bunch of other people that I know in the space. I was like, look, I'll do all your vocal tuning, all your drum editing. I just need some work. And so they were farming out basic stuff to me. So I got some work there, but I thought maybe if I just put out some content online, if I start to write about what I'm doing with my clients or share interesting stuff, interesting techniques or a cool challenge we had in the studio or a cool thing I did in a mix, 
at the very least, it would be something out there in the World Wide Web and somebody might find it, might be interested, might contact me and might want to hire me. And that's a lot of mights, a lot of ifs, but it seemed better than doing nothing. And it seemed better than not putting myself out online. Honestly, Recording Revolution, that was the beginning of it. That was all I wanted it to be was a few posts here and there that might attract some clientele, get me some more work. In the process, it was also like I was helping my friends out because I was always getting the same questions that you guys get about what, you know, what gear do I need and how do I use it and, how, and just my musician friends. So I thought, you know, I could kill two birds with one stone. I could answer all their questions and like a go to this website instead of emailing me every five days. Or, and also I could try to maybe get some traction online and maybe get some clients. So that was all I wanted to do. I didn't know any strategy. I didn't know the rules of content marketing or that it was even called that, but it made sense to me that it would be something for people to find and maybe get me some work. That's fascinating. I remember when I first kind of found out about your YouTube channel and saw some videos, I think I was actually doing research on where I could market my business. I remember in particular, was it Business Insider that came out on a, like an expose on you years and years and years ago? And mm-hmm. I remember reading it and just my jaw dropped. You know, they put some numbers out there that were really, really impressive. And to me, it was just this thing we admire so much on this podcast that you took audio skills and you turned them into a kick-ass business. And that's probably, I would guess, and I'd love to hear you speak to this. I doubt that your dream when you were younger and getting freelance projects was what you have now, was what you've accomplished. But I would guess that what you have now far exceeds what you hoped you would achieve. Oh, yeah. I never wanted to do what I do now. That wasn't my goal. I saw in my kid's school last year a bunch of pictures that were up on a bunch of classrooms where they had done a project of what you want to be when you grow up. And there's a lot of doctors, nurses, lawyers, basketball players. And one kid put YouTuber. <laughs> it was a first grader, right? <laughs> I want to be a YouTuber. Right. That, what? <laughs> that wasn't a thing when I was in first grade. That wasn't a thing when I was in college. <laughs> you know, it's like, what the, that shows how old I am. But like, I didn't grow up wanting to do YouTube or content. I didn't know. What I did know back in 09, when I started this thing was that there were these people out there blogging and they were making money off their blogs. I didn't know how. I knew there's grandmas having blogs and people just writing stupid blogs, but then there was people that were blogging and making an income. And I thought that's fascinating. Don't know how that works. That sounds great, but I don't know how to make that happen. But for sure, it's not something I planned on doing. It's not something that I said, I know how this is going to work and I'm going to do it. I tell people that I was afraid to be a business owner. I didn't like the instability of it. I didn't like the lack of certainty of where my mortgage was going to be paid for three months from now when I would have a project that was booked for the month of May. And then they say, hey, we got to reschedule for August because we have problems. I'm like, no, that's my rent money that month. I didn't like that. I liked predictability and stability. And so this is the last thing I thought I would be doing, but it's been an evolution and it's been like anything. It's a learning process, right? Like you can learn how to do audio, but you don't stop learning. Every time you have a project, there's something new you learn. So I feel like that's what the recording revolution has been is every year I'm learning something new, trying it and evolving and seeing where it goes. I think that's kind of what our goal is for our listeners is to be exposed to these new ideas, because this is something that we didn't have when we were growing up, when we were in high school, when we were graduating from high school or college for some of us, I didn't go to college, but Chris did. And we were trying to figure out what we wanted to do with our lives. Well, we weren't exposed to these new and interesting ideas that we could pursue. And so it's great for you to come on here and kind of shed the light on really you fell into this type of business. Can you give us kind of a glimpse at what your first kind of aha moment was when you realized that A, This content marketing thing that you didn't, you didn't know was called content marketing, but this content marketing thing is a viable strategy. And B, I can actually make a living, you know, by creating content that attracts my ideal customer to me instead of me having to go out and find them all the time. Yeah. So it was like a couple phases. There was the phase where I knew that I was creating content that was resonating with people, but there was no monetary gain at the time. So that was early on where it wasn't, I didn't have a big audience, but When you start something and nobody knows that you exist, when you put out content that nobody's looking for at the beginning, it's always shocking when someone like reads your article or watches your video and comments like, oh my gosh, how did you find me? And so when that started to happen and I started to get really good feedback from people like, man, this video made me understand compression or this video, I finally understand gain in my DAW or whatever it was when people were like, this was the light bulb moment for me. That's obviously an indicator that I'm connecting with them. Or if I said something that was controversial 
And they were like, I'm glad you said that. I've always thought about that, but no one's saying this or whatever it was. I could tell I was connecting, which is step number one to content marketing. You have to make content that people actually care about. You can't just do vanilla, boring, a million same 10 steps to this, 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 when it's just the same thing everyone else is doing. You got to, you got to, there's so much stuff out there. There was even back then, but there's even more now. You have to somehow connect with the human being. And there's a lot of ways to do that. Humor, people do a shock value with really scary, weird, shady stuff. I'm not a fan of that, but they're connecting. They're trying to connect with somebody, right? And so I was connecting. And in the first few months, I realized there's a little mini group of people. Maybe it's 50, maybe it's 100 that really love everything I'm doing. And they're like grateful that I exist. That's powerful when you have a little mini tribe that's like hanging on to your every word. It doesn't matter if it's big or small, that's the power. And so I've learned over the years that, you know, if you don't have an audience like that, nothing's going to be possible. But if you have an audience, it doesn't mean you'll make money right away, but anything is possible if you have an audience. And so that was an aha moment of I'm connecting with people. Maybe I should make more videos, which is the only reason why I made more because people kept asking for follow-up videos on stuff. And when I was in between gigs, I had time. I was just sitting at home. So I was like, well, I might as well. And then the second aha moment was when I wanted to teach people, I wanted to make a Pro Tools course. Everyone had so many Pro Tools questions back then. So I thought if I could have like a whole series on Pro Tools that was like way better than all the boring Pro Tools tutorials that I've seen online, I won't name any names, but they were all boring. They were taught by clearly like college professors that don't care about music or- We've are all seen those. Yeah, exactly. It was awful. So I was like, dude, I got to make a Pro Tools tutorial that's relevant. It's relatable. That's just, it's as if I was sitting down next to you having coffee, fire up Pro Tools for the afternoon and say, all right, let me just show it to you. Let me explain it to you so it's not scary anymore. And so I started to think about that. And at the time, YouTube only capped my videos at like 15 minutes or 10 minutes or something. I was like, I can't make anything longer. What I want to teach is going to be like a hundred YouTube videos. And at the time it wasn't really high quality video either. So it would reduce my screencast down to something really crappy. So I said, why don't I just shoot long form all three, four, five out, whatever it takes to explain Pro Tools. And then I'll throw it up on like a PayPal site and sell it and see if anyone sees the value in like this whole thing. And if they pay me a little bit of money, maybe that would be great. Maybe it'd help pay for my web hosting or whatever. And I remember my first sale of that first Pro Tools course. I wasn't even at home. I was in Seattle at a funeral and I was just checking email at a coffee shop. And it was like, you've you've got payment. I was like, for what? Like, I don't have a client right now. Like, who's paying me money? And it was for this course. That's how awful I was at online business. I'd launched a course and didn't expect anyone to buy it. I was like, who who wants to give me money? (laughs) But that was, that was the moment of, wait a second. I've already filmed this course. It already exists. It could be sold a million times. It's, it's a digital thing. What, what would happen if I had more people buying the same course or if I had more courses or both, then in my mind, the numbers seem to get more interesting And all I thought it might be was maybe a way to, again, to supplement my freelance work. If I could make a thousand bucks a month doing this over here or 2000, that'd be a nice supplement. That was a big aha moment for me. This might be worth working on. That's amazing. Do you remember the guy's name, the first sale? I've got it saved. It's like my first dollar. I have to pull up that image. I don't know his name. I had a similar experience when I launched my mastering business. We talked about it, I think just an episode or two ago. But I can remember so clearly the first time a stranger sent me money. And it was just this like, what? Like, oh my gosh. And that's such an important moment in a business's life when suddenly it's like, wait a minute. I don't know most of the people on earth. And one of them that I don't know just sent me money. I wonder if others would send me (laughs) Wait. (laughs) So that's a great story, man. That's fascinating. I think people listening completely understand the power of content marketing. It basically attracts your ideal customer to you through the content that you create. You're creating valuable content and you're adding value into their lives. And that attracts people to watch your videos and then they want to learn more and they naturally will find your other stuff. But I don't want to gloss over how much work it took to get to that first sale. Do you remember maybe how many videos you had put out or you know how long of a gap it was between when you started creating content on YouTube or maybe it was another site back then and then how much work it took to get to the point where someone was willing to actually hand you dollars? It was about 
six months of making content before I made my first like 40 bucks or 50 bucks. But granted, I didn't have a job. So in between gigs, I had a lot of time. I probably was logging a solid 20, 25 hours a week. And so I was making content three times a week. for The first four years was my pace. Three times a week, two articles, one video. So there's a couple of things there, right? Like it sounds magical. Like, yeah, make content. People come, they hear about you, they buy your stuff. It's true, but the nitty gritty is, is that one, you have to make, like I said, content that people actually want. If you don't know what people actually want for your ideal client, you got to go back to the research mode and find out who your ideal client is. And a lot of people don't even know that, but that's, I'm sure you've talked about that before, but figure out who your ideal client is. How else could you add value to them? If you know that, then you still have to stand out. You still have to be interesting. You still have to not have an angle, but you have to be willing to be 100% all in in this as opposed to like playing it safe. Like for example, this isn't really 100% related, but sometimes I review products on Recording Revolution. Not a lot. But when I do, I've had people criticize them saying, these are all overwhelmingly positive. You don't say anything negative about the product. And I tell people, that's because I only review stuff I really like. I'm not sound on sound. I'm not trying to give this generic sound on sound. I love the people there. I love the magazine. I'm just picking on that. But any type of site or magazine like that, they live off of sponsors. And so it's a constant thing where they're going to review a product and they're going to tell you the good stuff, the bad stuff. And it's always like, yeah, they're never really telling you if you should buy it or not. It's always like, yeah, if you want it, you should buy it. It's very safe. And there's a reason why, because they don't want to tick off any of their sponsors. And because that's safe, but you can't be safe anymore. They're big. They can do that. They've got a business model that's been around for decades. If you're a content creator, you need to stand out and be 100% you. So you got to make content that's like really gets people to go, whoa, interesting. You don't have to fake it. You don't have to create a fake persona. But whatever you really want to say or really want to show, go all in on it. Don't hold back. Try to make content that people both love and hate, not anywhere in the middle. And then two, you got to be consistent with it. You can't have like 30 ideas and then do those and then be done. If you only have 30 ideas, I would space them out one a week. So at least you got 30 weeks worth of content. But you have to constantly be coming up with new ideas and commit to a schedule because it's like a TV show or your favorite band. Like if they stop putting out a show or an album for a while and you don't hear from them for a while, you forget about them. And then someone else takes your attention. So you don't need to be crazy to get people's attention, but you have to consistently show up in their world. That is a commitment. It's like taking on another relationship where you're like, I'm not just going to hang out with you and date you for a few months. I'm going to commit to you for the next decade. Can you commit to making content for a decade? That sounds crazy, but if you make it manageable in your real life and everyone's different, it's worth thinking about it in those terms. So you're creating remarkable, interesting content for the long haul. But then you also have to have a plan for the content because I know people who have made great content, but they don't have a way of converting those viewers, those readers, those listeners into even more engaged fans who then hear about their services or products. And that's another part of it that's really important too. There's just so much to unpack from what you just said. (laughs) First of all, I want to get your input on what is your process for research first and foremost, and then actually organizing those ideas because we're big on systems. By now, I am 100% certain, although I may be wrong, I'm 99% certain that you have some sort of system that you follow at this point to do research and then organize that research and then formulate the ideas. Can you give us some specifics on that or at least some generalities on how we can adapt this for the home studio world if they're trying to do research and then how to take that research and create the content ideas and then how to organize those ideas so that you can create content over the next 30 weeks or however many ideas you have? Yeah, something that helps me and I am systematized, but it probably looks really casual. I'm not too rigid in terms of what it looks like, but at its core, what helps me creating content, because now I'm creating content for two different brands and two totally different niches every week. So I'm having to be very intentional and systematized. And what I do is I think through like, I picture my ideal person consuming my content. I picture them. And when it was recording revolution starting out, I literally pictured there's two or three of my friends. And every post I wrote, every video I do, and still to this day, I have them in mind, real people. And they become like an archetype. In essence, I know exactly what type of person I'm talking to, right? So I've got them in mind and I think about, okay, what kind of stuff do they want to help with? How could I serve them? What would be valuable to them? And I try to zoom out. What are like four or five or six buckets of topics, okay? So for example, in my newer brand, I'm helping people start a business or grow a business or 
pivot into work they love to do and get paid for it. And so it's those types of people that they need help growing this thing or figuring it out. And so I'm thinking, okay, there's a bucket of people who need information on how to just start your business. Like they're at the very beginning, just basic. How do you start? Then there's people that need sort of, how do you grow it? I've got it started. I'm making some money, but it's not hitting my income. How do you grow your business? That's another bucket. I'm very into work-life balance. I think it's a topic that is either not talked about or when it's talked about, it's not helpful or it's out of balance. And there's people that are all about work, 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 hustle, 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 and sacrifice everything for your business, which is an awful idea. It's a way to do well in some regards for people that give you a pat on the back and will get you promoted when you hustle for that, but then you lose everything else, your family, your sanity, your health, your sleep. That's not a win. So I want to talk about work-life balance as a bucket. And then to me, the mindset stuff is really important because people have all kinds of invisible scripts, all kinds of deep psychology, all kinds of insecurity, all kinds of issues that are mental that they're not thinking about that actually hold them back from being successful, even if they're doing all the tactics, because it's not all about tactics. You have to have a plan and a mindset. So in my mind, those are like four loose buckets that I want to continually be talking about things in those topics. And so that helps me think of content. So when I have an idea, I'm like, what bucket would that fit under? Or if I've been real heavy on work-life balance, I'm like, I need to get some more tactical, practical, starting your business stuff, like how to set up MailChimp, how to build email lists, how to, you know, build a product. And so it keeps me thinking in a balance of type of content. And I go looking for some of those and I try to rotate through those. And so that's a framework I use. And then what I'm doing, my research is just talking to real people. When it's recording Revolution Land, it's a lot easier because there's such a built-in following, whether it's YouTube comments, emails back to me, comments on the blog, social media responses. There's already sort of this massive community that if I just pay attention, I can get a pulse on what people are asking, what content they're really liking and engaging with, what content gets like crickets. Like I thought it was a great video, but no one seems to care. And so I can figure out, oh, people would really love to know more about this. And I start to jot it down in my Google Doc with those four buckets. And it's just bullet points. Like I'll do a post on, you know, how to get that Foo Fighters, Dave Grohl, double vocal effect. Somebody asked about that. That would be helpful. That's pretty basic. But if they don't know that that's what he's doing is doubling his voice, then I could show them what that looks like. So I just leave a note on that or whatever. So I'm always pay attention to my audience. With the new business, I didn't have an audience. So I just got on my personal Facebook feed and started to ask people, hey, those of you who have thought about starting a business or pivoting out of your job. Why was it? What were you most frustrated with? What would be ideal for you? And I would start conversations with people and whoever would respond, I would then go back and forth with them and ask them more questions. And I was trying to understand those people well, because I have a million things I could share, but I don't know what's on their mind. So it gave me a bunch of ideas like, oh, they want to know about this. They're confused about this. They don't know about this. And then I just put them in those buckets in a list. And generally I try to have like, three to six months worth of content ideas mapped out so I don't feel stressed when I sit down to make a piece of content. I could pull from one of those. But I also know that stuff will come up that I find interesting. We might talk about something today on this show that might give me an idea and I'll jot it down and say, you know, I'm going to talk about that. I know it's not in my list, but I'll add it. You have the freedom to do that. And then when I see my list getting really short, sometimes I'm like, I got to go away for the day. Or I sometimes I just get away in the hotel. I go to the beach. Or I just spend, I hold myself up in a nice coffee shop and I put in headphones. I listen to like Pat Metheny or something. And I just like bust through a bunch of ideas of like other stuff I could talk about for the next six months so that I'm not stressed out when I see that list getting short. Could you kind of give us a picture of how you actually map the content out? What sort of format do you leave that content in so it's easily accessible and organized in a way that you're not just going to like, because I have a habit of just putting things in Evernote and then it just gets buried <laughs> somewhere that I never find it again. Right. It's ever lost inside (laughs) of your Evernotes. I'm pretty simple. I use Google Docs, but Evernote would work great. And I have like one master doc for my bulleted ideas. So it's like the topic ideas. And so that's the only place I add or strike through ideas. So like I did a video that came out yesterday for the Graham Cochran brand. And it was, people have been asking me like, can you show me a day in the life? What do your work days look like to run your businesses? And people think there's something special that I do. And a lot of what I think makes what I do work is just the fact I'm very consistent. I've been doing the same thing for nine years. I haven't let up. So I just wanted to show them the boring, consistent structure of my day that it'd be like a light bulb. Like, look, I show up at the same time every day. I have set boundaries. So people had asked me for this video. I knew I wanted to do it. It was a bullet in my master list. And when I shot it last week and edited it and it went up, 
strike through so I don't need it anymore, or you could delete it. And then let's say I want to make that video. Let's go back in time. I'm like, I want to do this video for next week. Then I have a separate Google Doc, which is my outline doc. If it's a really in-depth video, that's where I'm going to have like the loose title of the video, the category, like the bucket that I think I'm going to post it in. And then introduction, the three main points, like a good Baptist sermon, right? Like three main points. (laughs) And then uh, your conclusion. It just really works for people. People can't remember more than three main points if you're teaching something. So three or less is very helpful for me. Sometimes it's two. But when you go past three, it's like, dude, just it might be amazing, but maybe save it for another post or break it up. But my three main points, the conclusion, any other like, I want to add a graph. I want to add this link. I want to add any kind of images. I'll just sort of have all that in my outline doc. So it's just two docs. It's my idea doc with the buckets and the bullets, my outline doc. If it's an intense, not intense, but an in-depth piece of content. If it's just like me showing a cool vocal distortion thing I did inside of Pro Tools on a mix, I kind of know what those main points are. And so I won't make an outline. I'll just jot down for myself. All right, make sure I show this, this, and this is a common question they're probably going to ask if I show them this. So anticipate that question and address it in the video. And then this is how I'm going to conclude the video. I either want to ask them for a comment or ask them to opt in for this freebie or this lead magnet, which is another thing we could talk about, but knowing how I'm going to end and what's the uh, call to action going to be at the end. So I loosely know it's like a shorter version of that. And then I go. For those of you listening, the video he mentioned about a day in the life of Graham Cochran, that will be in our show notes. If you go to the sixfigurehomestudio.com slash 46, that's slash 46. We'll have that, the link in there along with a bunch of other links that we mentioned throughout this interview. You talked about the day in the life of Graham Cochran, but can you kind of give us an overview of your week? Because you, like you said, you're creating content for two different brands, Graham Cochran, the virtual business coach, and then Recording Revolution that you've been doing for nine years now. What does a week look like as far as segmenting out your week for content creation, ideation, you know, video recording, video editing, if you do that, you know, all of these things are important when it comes to content creation. And by the way, if you are a home studio and you're just trying to implement a very basic content strategy, this is not going to be the way your week looks, but just getting an idea of the way it looks when you're doing this full time is going to give you some ideas for how you can take that and adapt it. The 80, 20 principle, the last episode you listened to, On the podcast, episode number 45, where we talked about the 80-20 principle, this all applies to this entire episode. So don't get overwhelmed by this, but Graham, yeah, you're you're weak. Oh, yeah. Well, you're just speaking my, one of my love languages is the Pareto's principle, 80-20 rule. (laughs) I I love efficiency um, because I'm trying to get a lot done. I'm trying to run two content brands. I'm trying to be a a musician because I create new music every year. Up until recently, I was the worship leader at our church on a volunteer basis. I do interviews like this. I have calls. I have clients that I'm coaching one-on-one. There's all these things I'm trying to do, and I'm trying to do it in such a short time frame because I want to have time to take my kids to school, pick them up from school, have all my evenings free, not work weekends. So I'm asking a lot of my work week. I'm going to go listen to your episode on the 80-20 rule because I love that, and I love to hear how people are implementing that. But a typical week as of now, and I will say every January, it's usually when I'm flying to the NAMM show. It's always when I'm on the plane to NAMM, I'm always like pulling out pad and paper and I'm like, all right, what worked last year with my schedule and what didn't work? Because it's evolved over the years and I'm always trying to make it better. Sometimes I err too much on the side of efficiency, like a robot. And then when real life bumps up against it, I go, okay, let's be a little more realistic and okay, what's a compromise? But it's usually in January that I assess my schedule. In the last two years, this has been about my schedule. So I'm finding a rhythm that's working well, especially in light of running two brands. That's a long preface. Answer your question is (laughs) Mondays, So I front load everything. The most important things to run the businesses, I front load. So for me, it's content, free content. The free stuff I give away is the fuel for the engine that generates revenue for me that allows me to do what I do. So without content, everything dies. And so I, Mondays are recording revolution day. So on a Monday, I get in 9 a.m., I'm in the office and I work between nine and two, Monday through Thursday. So that's my schedule. So I have five hours on a Monday. And I have five hours to do everything I need to do for the recording revolution. So basically these days, that's shooting, editing, and prepping one main video that'll go out the following week. And then it's answering email. I have an assistant that helps me with that who takes care of customer service emails and deletes all the mean emails. I never have to see them anymore. (laughs) That does a lot for your mental health, I'm sure. It does. I was a stress case for a couple of years. Like, this is not good for me. I need to stop seeing these mean emails. So he does that. And then also like 
And then he highlights all the nice emails, the thank you emails. So I get to see all those and respond to all those people and then answer questions that only I can answer. Answering email, interacting with students inside of my paid courses or membership sites. So like answering their questions, a little bit of interaction on social media, since I'm not really on social media outside of work hours. It's like, here's my 20 minutes for Facebook this week. I kind of do that. Then it's done. So it's basically keep another video in the pipeline for Recording Revolution is on Mondays. Then a mirror image of that on Tuesdays now with a new brand to do a similar thing for the Graham Cochran brand. I like batching it because they're two totally different things. I'm thinking about totally different stuff for business coaching and that type of content than I am music. So it allows me to keep my music brain on one day and then shut it off and not jump to another mental space. And then Tuesday, I do a video and content, interact with people there for the Graham Cochran brand. And then Wednesdays and Thursdays are my flex days. And so those look different almost every week. That's where I batch all my calls or interviews like this. I'll do on Wednesdays or Thursdays only. Coaching, if I have a client or a group coaching call with like some members from my membership sites, it's when I'm creating new products, if I'm creating courses, it's when I'm recording music for myself, it's when I'm mixing for clients, if I'm doing a song or a single or an EP for somebody. It, all of that stuff fits within Wednesdays and Thursdays because I know I've done the stuff that drives the ship that pays the bills. So now I'm more flexible to either mess around or take longer on something or do something that's completely not strategic for my business, but is fun and enriching, or I just get lost on YouTube sometimes. And that's helpful too, or not helpful. I'm just watching Star Wars videos, but I need to, you know, it's fun. <laughs> and then at that point, it's Friday. I don't work on Friday, Saturday, or Sunday. And then I rinse and repeat the next week. So it's really that's those four days and I do it in those blocks. I actually thought I'd be way more overwhelmed by your schedule based on how much content you put out. But this is actually really eye-opening to me just because the fact that you fit all that you do really on Mondays and Tuesdays, the bulk of the front-facing stuff, the stuff that we see on the recording revolution the past nine years, it's incredible to see how consistent, how much content you have first and foremost, and how consistent you are with that content. And then now on top of that, you haven't let up on that and you're still doing the new Graham Cochran brand once or twice a week. That's encouraging to me as a content creator to know that to put out that level of content doesn't have to be that you're slaving away 40 hours a week putting content out constantly. It would be what you were talking about earlier, the 80-20 rule. I try to every year on that same flight to NAM. it's usually the same time of year, I'm like assessing, are there things I can cut? Because we all think everything we do is important. Otherwise, we wouldn't be doing it. But it's just not true. Everything has some level of importance generally, but it, is it the best use of my time? And I'm always curious as to what can I just cut and see if nothing really falls apart or very minimal falls apart. That's always interesting because then you can free up a lot of time. So there's that rule, the 80-20 rule. And then there's Parkinson's law, which is just brilliant. When I heard Tim Ferriss explain how the two work together, and Parkinson's law is that it states that work always expands to fill whatever time you give it. It's sort of like this, this observation that if you give yourself a week to do something, it'll take you a week. Give yourself a day, it'll take you a day. And so Tim Ferriss was the first person I heard who said like, look, can't we just sort of hack Parkinson's law in such a way that we, what if I just give myself a shorter deadline than I need? It might force me to focus and get it done faster. So he uses the two together, only do the 20% that matters and then give yourself a really short deadline for that 20%. So it like, you get super, super focused. Um, but there's some things that go along with that. Like to make this work, I can't have any distractions. I basically don't answer my phone during those hours unless it's my wife or an emergency. I don't really, I don't play on social media really. I don't look at stuff. I don't have my inbox open. I only check email once a day because I know those things will be time sucks for me. Even if it's just five, 10, 20 minutes here or there. There's a study that says the average employee in corporate America gets distracted every three minutes and then it takes on average 20 minutes to get back to where they were before to do what they were doing. That compounding every day, every week, there's so much wasted time in corporate America. These 50, 60 hour a week jobs probably only have a solid 10 to 20 hours of good work, maybe in them. So that's the thing behind it is I used to do a lot more and I've had to say no to things like I can't respond to every YouTube comment. Like I learned that in year one. I just can't. And people are like, why don't you respond? Because I'm trying to make a video for you. I, I have to choose. Do you want me to respond to you or make free videos? I can't do both with my schedule. So I'm having to learn that. And every year I get more efficient. But yeah, it's really not hard. And somebody asked me in an interview last week, wasn't it crazier at the beginning? Like, don't you have to like really go after it hard at the beginning? Now it's easy for you now. 
because you have all this built-in momentum. And yes, it's gotten easier in terms of I can be more efficient and I can feed the machine a little less gas because the car's in motion and it can still go at that speed. But I still have always had clear boundaries. So I worked more hours in the past. I don't, Recording Revolution took the full three, four days a week of eight hour days nine years ago. Now it only takes me five hours a week. But it still was only 32 hours a week back then. It wasn't, I wasn't working crazy, crazy hours. So it can be less time than you think. And if you really value the other things you're trying to do, and not everybody wants to run multiple content brands, but maybe you just want time to go to the gym. or Maybe you just want time to have dinner with your family every night. Or maybe you just need more sleep. And you're like, I would love to get to bed earlier, but I just got so much to do. I would question, maybe you don't have so much to do. You think you have so much to do, but is what you're doing, is all of it valuable? Or could you shed some of it, delegate some of it, or automate some of it in a way that frees up your time and you still can get 80, 90% of the way there? Man, that is fascinating. I am like zeroed in on what you're saying right now. Obviously, you are, like us, an enormous Tim Ferriss fan. And I think I read one of your emails a couple weeks ago where you talked about you got four-hour work week the year it came out and then returned it because you didn't like it. <laughs> <laughs> and that to me is like, oh man, that is freaking awesome. Because my story was similar. The first time I read that book, I talked about this in the last episode, it sat on the couch behind me for three months racking up late fees from the library before I even opened it. And I opened it to chapter five. I didn't read it cover to cover at first. But anyways, the thing I love that Tim talks about in that book that just blew my mind that I think you have clearly done an amazing job at is that you have taken ownership of lifestyle design. You knew how you wanted your life to look and you figured out how to make it look that way. So I would love to hear you talk about being a husband, being a father, what you would rather be doing than working that drives you to want to cut things out of your schedule. Because as a dad, like I don't know you very well, but I'm picking up this dad vibe that that's you know, obviously one of the most important things in your life. And that's one of the hardest things for me in my work is balancing putting my family first and then at the end of the day, not constantly being able to turn off at the end of the day is very difficult for me. But the most important thing in the world, the whole reason I have a business instead of a job is so that I have the freedom to spend time with my family whenever I want. I'd love to hear you talk about the impetus for what you do. Why do you take Fridays off? What would you rather do with your time than work? I mean, that's, I love that last line. What would you rather do with your time than work? There's a danger to doing work that you love. Is that you love it. Mm-hmm. So you do too much of it. The danger also is that you start to affix your identity to it. It becomes who you are. So if the business is doing well, you feel good about yourself. If it's not doing well, like all businesses do from time to time, you feel like there's something wrong, not just with the business, but with you. That's why you can't shut it off at night because it's eating at you. It's like an attack on you. If money's coming in, even if you don't know why, there was years where like it was doing well. I'm like, why? It covers up all of the insecurities and the flaws in your business. Generally, if there's profit, the business is working, right? And so you feel like I'm great. So there's so many dangers to doing work that you love that it's easy to throw yourself in it and hard, like you said, Chris, to shut it off when you are with the people you love the most, when you're not even working physically, you're still mentally working. Yeah, That's the hardest thing for me. So I would first say is that I don't have that on lock. I'm very good with my physical boundaries. That just takes discipline and your wife or your partner or your kids to keep you accountable. But I think anybody can get better at that. Some people say, oh, I get distracted at work and it lingers. Yeah, you might need to work on saying, this is when I'm working and this is when I'm not working. That might be your issue. But I've got that on lock. I don't have a problem with that. I'm pretty disciplined as a person. This is harder in the mind because your mind's always thinking about stuff and creative ideas and or just problems or I need to haven't gotten paid by that person or I need to update that thing or whatever it is. So I just want to first acknowledge that I don't have this figured out and I still struggle with it. And I get better every year, but I'm learning new stuff every year. But all that to say, I started taking Fridays off for a very practical reason. And that was because when I started my business, it was all around the same time we had moved to Florida to help my buddy start a church. And I was like, I'll move and I'll come be the music guy and help you out. And we were like a set up, tear down church. And so Saturdays, to just to rehearse with a band, I would have to leave my house like seven, eight in the morning, drive into town to the storage unit, get all the gear, go to the rehearsal place, set it up, rehearse for a couple hours, take it back. I mean, by the time I was home, it was one, two in the afternoon. I had a few hours with my family 
And then Sundays is the same thing, just but for the church service. So I never had a full day off. And I was basically like counseled by someone older and wiser to say, look, you got to find a day off. And Fridays became the day. And I was like, okay, I'll just take Fridays off. And when your kids are little, or if you homeschool, then you know you can be with your kids on Fridays, which is great. We call it Family Fun Friday. That's what it was for years. That was the day that daddy wasn't working. We could go to the park. We could go to the pool. We could go to the beach. We could just hang out in the house and play board games. Or maybe it wasn't a fun day, but it's still a family Friday. We were together doing errands and going to TJ Maxx and returning crap. You know, it's like <laughs> we were still together. And that was really important. Now my girls are in elementary school, so they're at school during the day. But that rhythm has been in place where Fridays are still off. So now. I value my time on Friday because now Saturday is my family day because I no longer in the worship guy, I don't have to run rehearsals. So I have Saturday with them and Sunday. So Friday becomes like, I'll go get my hair cut. I'll go ride my bike for two hours. I'll go do that errand. I'll meet up with a friend for coffee. Last Friday, my wife and I just went out and got brunch because we could. So it's those kind of like not work, not family time, but the extra stuff. And that's a luxury to have. But I don't think I would be doing that had I not put that boundary in place from day one because my family was pretty important. I don't mean this in any negative way. I'm glad I wasn't single when I started my business because I think with my personality and knowing what I love about running my businesses now, I think I would have thrown myself all in. I think having the family, that necessity of I got to be responsible and I have to be available. And at my core, I want to be available for evenings and weekends. It forced me to say like, how can I run my business as efficient as possible And I've grown to love that. I think I almost did it out of like an obligation back in the day of like, this is the right thing to do. I don't want to be that dad that's never around if I can avoid it, especially if I'm in, if we're a business owner and we control our schedule, we almost have no excuse to not. Amen. Yeah. And that's almost harder, that pressure of like, look, there's no one telling me what to do. So I need to tell myself the right thing to do. How would I counsel a version of me in my shoes? What would I tell that guy? I would tell them, well, if you don't want to lose your marriage and if you want your kids to know you and if you want them to not be crazy people when they're adults, they need their dad around. You don't have to be with them 24 hours a day, but you got to be there every day with them. And that can look different for every family. Everyone's got a different routine, a different schedule, but find a way to regularly be in their world. And if not, then I'm missing the point of my business because I, this is a worldview thing and a personal belief, but I don't think that I exist primarily to run the recording revolution or GrahamCochran.com or help people with their businesses. I think that is a huge part of what I'm called to do while I'm on this earth. I feel like my most important job and calling is to love my wife well and raise my daughters well. That will have much more impact in the rest of the world. And it's the closest thing to me. If I have a successful recording revolution land and I'm helping people with their music and helping them with their businesses, but my family's falling apart, then on the outside, I'm in success. And it feels good to have people sing your praises, but inside I know I'm making a mess of my life and my family and that would haunt me the rest of my life. I don't feel like that's a good trade. So I want to value my work. It has to be in the right order. And that's the whole idea. Like, have you read, is it Greg McEwen's book, Essentialism? I have. My wife has been trying to get me to read that for the past month. Read that book. There's so many great nuggets in there. But one of the things he said that struck me was, and I believe it was in that book, so correct me if I'm wrong, but I think he was talking about the word priorities in the English language did not exist until 100 years ago. It used to always be singular, priority. That was the word. You have a priority. We just started to invent, well, let's have multiple priorities. That was not a thing in the English <laughs> language for centuries. And I feel like that's such an American invention that like, everything's a priority. Everything's important. And when everything's important and a priority, right, nothing's a priority. It doesn't help you. Now everything's, you know, at the top. And so with your life, and then I'll shut up, but in your life, you have to decide, and this takes a little bit of maturity to say, for me, what is number one? If I had to exclude everything, what is number one? That's hard to do because they're all so important. And then what's number two, number three, four. So I have that list, that mental list, and then having that's one step. But actually creating your schedule and your week and your calendar to reflect those things, that's another thing. And I always have to check myself. You say family is important to you. You say your wife and kids are above work in your order of importance. But does your calendar reflect that in the truest sense? And I think I spend a lot of time at work compared to with my kids because I only see them in the morning. And well, I don't know. It might be even now. It wasn't always. And if you have a 40-hour work week, that's kind of hard. But in terms of like the time that you should be able to spend with your family, does it reflect? what you say is important to you. Yeah, I heard a quote that I like. It said, show me your calendar and I'll show you your priorities. 
And I think that really kind of explains a lot of what you just said there. But there's one final thing, and then we'll kind of wrap this interview up here that I want to talk about. And that is shiny objects, because you have systematized your business to the point of where you're able to run the recording revolution from what it sounded like, you know, five, 10 hours a week or so. And you've been doing that for years now. What's keeping you from letting all these shiny objects really distract you? Like there's, I know in our world, there's the whole rabbit hole of paid advertising. There's the rabbit hole of affiliate marketing. There's all these little rabbit holes that you can really put your focus into and it can distract you from what's really working. How do you keep yourself from getting distracted and moving into directions you maybe shouldn't be moving towards? Yeah. Shiny object syndrome. When I started out, what kept me from that was ignorance. I didn't know about many of those things. So that was one that helped. (laughs) Two, I'm a very simple person. If I see something work, it's the same with the way I mix music and record music. Some people like that about me, that my mixing approach is very simple, doesn't really change. And some people hate that about me. They're like, this is so boring. Like, you're not, do- where's the side chain compression? So I'm very simplistic. When I find something that works, I don't want to reinvent the wheel. So I would like to find what works and then do lots of it and go big on it. For me, it's been content. And it's so funny because There was a period of time when I started to really learn and study other people who have done this content marketing or passive income or online business in general in all kinds of niches. When I finally started to study, I was already wildly successful beyond anything I ever expected, but I was like, how can I get better? Let me really go to school for this, as it were. And I started to hear everyone doing all these other things. You know, you got to do webinars, you got to do paid ads, you got to do all this stuff. And it wasn't stuff I was doing. And I didn't really hear a lot of people talking about content marketing. And so I started to question my own strategy. I'm like, am I doing something wrong? Like these big boys are doing all these other things. But I was like, but it's working. It's making me money. So isn't that the point? Like it's working. I don't need to fix what's not broken. And it's been interesting in the last year or so, so many of those people that I would follow that wouldn't talk about content marketing are now all about content. It's all about content. The reason why specifically, there's a lot of reasons. One of them is that paid advertising is how helpful as it is, is very tricky when they keep changing the rules. Yeah. Amen. <laughs> you know, if you knew Facebook ads in 2015, you're screwed in 2018 unless you've learned what they've changed. YouTube is changing it. Google's changed. Everything's changing. So it's like, you have to really be all in. And so they're like, man, maybe I need to not base my whole business on this one thing. And so they're looking back to content as another pillar. And I just happen to have been doing content forever. I don't think it's necessary. Well, I do think it's better. That's my opinion. But <laughs> I don't think it's the only way, right? To be successful. I've learned that, man, if this works, why change it? Now, when things stop working or you see a decline, you got to pay attention and go, okay, what, what's not working anymore? And what do I need to change? And I've tried different things, but generally I've stuck to the same core thing, which is content. It's more about like the type of content, frequency of content, how I'm interacting with people, how I'm leading people to join my email list. What kind of products am I offering? Am I offering enough? Am I offering the wrong stuff? So I keep it simple. And then also, I don't know if this makes any sense, but you're going to be at two stages with your business. You're either at your income goals or you're not. And so a lot of people, maybe you're listening, you're like, I'm not making the money I want to make. So you're trying to grow, grow, grow. So then you might be trying lots of different things. And it's okay to try lots of different things. But when you see success, go all in on it until something changes. But even for those people that are trying to grow, I think all of us need to know how much money is enough. For example, I make enough money to be a happy human being and to take care of my family. I don't need more But every resource that's out there assumes that you want more. And I have to be careful about that. As I teach people how to grow their businesses in this new brand, a lot of times they don't make any money or enough money for them. And so I'm trying to help them grow. But I always am trying to be careful. Like I shot a whole video that'll go out next week. I did an informal survey on Instagram of like, how much money do you make? People private message me. I got a bunch of them. How much money do you make now? What's the amount that would be enough for you? Annual income. And I got a bunch of responses and it was interesting to see what the different income levels are, what the different target numbers are. And then what's interesting to me is what's that percentage increase? Because there was consistency among what the percentage growth was. I won't spoil it for you. You can go watch the video, but it- Interesting. It doesn't matter how much you make. Everybody wanted more. And the percentage was very, very close to how much more they wanted, which shows me we never feel like we have enough. So- Man, if you can say what your enough is and have a hard conversation with yourself and look at your budget and say, actually, I don't need any more than this. Like, bro, if you're making 70K a year and you're like, I'm listening to the six-figure home studio 
guys and I want to make six figures. I need to make six figures. There's nothing wrong with that goal, right? But what if you actually looked at your budget and you're like, look, I'm actually able to live a pretty good life at 70K and I'm actually able to do everything I need to do. Maybe I can stop stressing about these other things like paid ads or webinar. Maybe I can just enjoy it. Maybe I can work a little bit less and still have a good quality of life. There's something powerful about knowing what enough is. And as an American, Western culture, that's a word we're very unfamiliar with. More is better. I want as much as I can get. And I think that we do ourselves a disservice. I think we overwork because we think we need more. We might actually be okay with less. I've made conscious decisions to say no to opportunities that would have made me more money, but it would have cost me more time or more stress. And I don't need more money. So I'm in this weird place of like, I want to grow it and do a good job, but I don't need more money. So there's some power when you can just say, no, no, I don't need that. I'd actually be fine if my income cuts in half. So I'm good. And that's a healthy, happy place to be at whatever that level is for you. That's great stuff, man. This is challenging me in all the best ways. So yeah, I really appreciate everything you've had to say. This is, I think, the highest praise I've ever given on the podcast before, but I'm going to listen to this episode with my wife. (laughs) (laughs) That's awesome. And that's saying a lot, Graham, because Chris has probably never actually listened to our podcast before. And I'm not joking. It's true. I have a po- well, I had a podcast with, with our buddy Joe Gilder and I never listened back to those episodes. <laughs> so I understand. I think it's like a podcast thing, but yeah. I'm glad it's impact. I hope it's helpful. I think these are questions. I mean, I love tactics. I love email funnels. I love optimization, but I'm more interested in these big questions because they affect those things. And man, at the end of the day, if you're chasing six figures, which I think is a, is a fine and noble goal, why is it? Like the question beneath that is why? You probably want a certain quality of life, probably want a certain amount of freedom. And I like getting back to those questions. What is it you're actually chasing? What would an ideal week look like yeah. for you? An ideal yep. type of work, the ideal people you're working with, family life. That's really what you're after. And you think six figures will get that for you. And it might be what you need, but just don't miss the, the actual target. And if the income goal is a means to an end, that's fine. But don't make it the end because believe me, when you get to six figures, it'll be fun for a while. I remember you talk about being all about dad life, Chris. When we first made six figures, the next thing we did was go out and buy a minivan, right? <laughs> we bought, we paid cash for a minivan and I was like, I'm all in the dad life now. And I was loving that six figure year. That's awesome. But after a year or two of that, you're like, hmm, I could use some more money. What would it be like to make 200,000 a year? What would it be like to make? 500. And then you're like, what would it be like to make a million a year? I mean, it's never enough. And those are all fun goals to grow, but we got to get to the foundation of why before we go down these rabbit holes. And like you said, Ryan, look at all the shiny objects and be obsessed with like, gotta get this up. But maybe you've forgotten why. Maybe there is no reason why. We've talked about that on the podcast in the past. I forget the episode number, but we talked about, we see a lot of people that are just so driven for success. They want a Grammy. They want the affirmation of, look, mom, I'm good at this. And, you know, with the Grammy, it's like, yeah, that'd be awesome to get a Grammy. But why? Why would you want a Grammy? That's a quite literal shiny thing. What will it get you other than the thing to put on your bookshelf? And I think that you're hitting the nail on the head of the ultimate question that you have to ask yourself ahead of which email marketing provider should I use or should I run paid ads or not? Or should I be in the box or out of the box? Why? What do you want your life to look like? What's the end goal? And boy, you know, I think that's all three of us as four hour work week homeboys. That sounds like that was all a very big life change for us when Tim preached the gospel of lifestyle design and we bought it. Graham, where can people find out more about you and get in contact with you? Yeah, I would say um, if you're interested in the business stuff, go to GrahamCochran.com. And you can hit me up right there on the site. And there's a bunch of free videos every week. So you can check that out. And then if you don't know the Recording Revolution stuff, that's all at recordingrevolution.com or on YouTube for either one of those. Awesome. Thank you so much, man. Yeah. Thank you for coming on. That was freaking awesome. Yeah. Thanks for having me. So that is it for this episode of the Six Figure Home Studio Podcast. I'm sure you got a lot of that. All I can say is, wow. Graham Cochran is the master of not only being efficient, He clearly gets a lot done in a little bit amount of time, but that's because he is the master of also being effective in what he does. And this is something that I think we need to talk about more on the podcast and something that I've been listening to a lot of podcasts, a lot of audio books, a lot of physical books. I read a lot. And this idea of being effective comes up over and over and over and over again. And it's actually in the four hour work week as well. And being efficient 
is important, right? We, we talked about it on the podcast, but there's no use in being efficient if you're being efficient at the wrong thing. One example, we've talked about this on the podcast before, but if you want to be very efficient at your entire mix prep process, like I am, and you do all this work to systematize your checklists and your onboarding, and you get an assistant to help all the mix prep for you, and then you dive in, and you start mixing, that's really efficient. But if you are terrible at mixing and your mixes sound terrible and no one ever wants to hire you for your mixes, that's not a very effective use of your time. So this whole idea of being effective you can be very inefficient, really, but if you're focusing on the things that are effective in your business, you're focusing on that 20% that gives you 80% of the results, that's where the real magic can happen. And once you hone in on what it is that's the most effective for you and what your goals are, then you can start worrying about being efficient with those things. So a lot of what Graham said in this interview really goes along with that 80-20 principle that we talked about on episode 45, which is the previous episode of this one. But one thing we didn't really talk about on that episode is What Graham touched on in this interview was what is enough? What are you working towards? What are your real long-term goals? And if what you're doing is not matching up with those goals and those ideals and what you're really truly trying to achieve, then you're not being very effective. So this is a good wake-up call for me and what I'm doing with the Six Figure M Studio, with 456 Recordings, and with my other business dealings that I have going on to really sit down and clarify what it is that my goals are in my personal life and my professional life and see really where the mismatch is so that I'm not wasting time becoming efficient at the wrong things. There's no use being efficient if you're not going to be effective. So that's my big takeaway is what is my big focus going to be and what do I need to get rid of in my life, in my business? If you have any questions or comments or input related to this interview, you can just go to our show notes at the sixfigurehomestudio.com slash 46, that's slash four six. And in those show notes, there are links to literally everything we talked about. Any video he mentioned from his uh, channel will be on that page. Links to past podcast episodes are on that page. But more importantly, there's a link to the discussion for this episode. We have an official discussion for this episode going inside the Six Figure Home Studio community. If you ask us a question, me and Chris are going to be in there to answer questions. Even if you're listening to this episode months and months later, we are tagged in this episode. So we will see the questions that you ask months down the road. And I cannot make any promises, but I'm going to ask Graham if he'll come in and answer some questions. So if you have any questions related to this episode, not just random, ask me anything style questions for Graham, but questions related to this episode from things he said and things that popped into your head as you're listening. If you want to ask those questions, we'll, we'll try to see if Graham will come in and uh, devote a little bit of time, but there's no promises, but we'll see what we can do. Again, the link for that is the show notes, which is the six figure home studio.com slash 46. Next week, we have an episode coming to you that's going to be something different than we've talked about before. And this is an episode about building a team. Now, we're not talking about hiring. Most people are not in any position to hire right now. I'd say 80 or 90% of you should not be hiring yet. But what we are talking about is building a team of service providers around you of people that could potentially refer work to you and that you could refer work to them. This is something that every single one of you should have and can definitely have no matter what level you're at. And so we're going to go over each of the key team members that you should have in your back pocket so that you can start sending bands, referring bands to them, and they can hopefully be referring work back to you. So stay tuned next Tuesday at 6 a.m. when that episode goes live. Until then, thanks for listening and happy hustling. Whoa.